now that we've covered the various financial derivatives for energy commodity trading it's time to address the risk controls that are truly necessary to hopefully avoid major trading losses today's market environment dictates the need for risk controls in financial energy derivative trading um, they've probably never been as important as they have been now there's a history of huge losses you have those early case studies that um, hopefully you read before viewing this mini lecture there was the huge Enron debacle and some of these things are still occurring today uh, as recently as last month we found out that um, JP Morgan in fact had made huge losses in credit default swaps uh, again because of improper oversights over some of their traders there's also extreme volatility in energy commodity prices the fickle and teetering global economy impacts the uh, price of crude oil every single day the geopolitical climate with unrest in the Middle East um, you have some revolution in places like Nigeria these all impact the price of crude as well in addition there's a credit crunch uh, after the huge financial collapse of 2008 there are, uh, is certainly a risk of losses due to counterparties collapsing also increased margin requirements in lesson seven we talked about the margin requirements associated with um, each energy commodity to in order to trade this uh, speaks to huge cash flow issues if you're going to trade in those weather patterns uh, La Nina El Nino global warming and even unpredictable hurricane seasons each one of these can have an impact on energy prices adding to the overall validity of energy financial commodity derivatives various financial risks that are out there we have market risk that is uh, price risk operational risk can we and or our counterparties perform under the contracts there is a liquidity risk these days are there going to be enough counterparties out there that are financially sound and are willing to make market for us when we want to go into the market um, also the prospect of exchange interruptions uh, blackout in a major city could in fact shut down some exchanges the New York Mercantile Exchange itself was shut down for two or three days um, after 9-11. And then, of course, part of the financial risks these days is the speed at which these transactions occur. We have electronic trading. We have virtually 24-hour day, 365 a day, excuse me, uh, days a year trading going on globally. We have the International Petroleum Exchange in London, the International Continental Exchange in Atlanta, Georgia, the NYMEX. Uh, Globex, which is owned by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and then Clearport, which is a NYMEX electronic over-the-counter uh, trading platform. When you hit that buy or sell button, the uh, transaction occurs at the speed of light, and there's no taking it back. Other risks that uh, most companies face, legal risks. We have standardized contracts to hopefully mitigate that, the ISDA, uh, the NASB, and of course, force majeure clauses. Uh, essentially list a host of reasons why uh, one of the two party counterparties to the contract may not be able to perform and can be excused I mean such this, things as uh, acts of God and strikes and failure of equipment and so on credit is a big risk in the post 2008 economic collapse everyone is concerned about uh, the credit of their counterparties the counterparty liquidity the number of parties that you can actually trade with and then the solvency of the counterparties with whom you enter into financial derivative contract arrangements risk controls some of the main topics why controls you've already studied the case studies in the financial markets which led to the development of a system of risk controls which were later mandated in the energy industry we'll talk about some specific risk measures um, energy commodity trading and why uh, risk measures are necessary there the types of controls that need to be implemented and then finally some recommendations if you were to do a risk analysis for a company and turn around and hand them a consultancy report these would be some of the things that you would look for and then recommend you've already covered these three um, case studies in detail Metal Gazelle Shaft with their 1.5 billion dollar loss in trading Ford oil contracts um, the Orange County investment pool a loss of 1.64 billion dollars in bond and interest rate trading Barings Bank an estimated 1.3 to 1.5 billion dollar loss uh, where uh, Nick Leeson was trading stock index futures 
and then Aramanth uh, in September 2006. Here in uh, the United States, they lost six billion dollars in trading NYMEX futures. Some common issues, and I hope that you uh, found these uh, through each of those case studies that there was a general uh, theme or themes running through there. You had single or multiple rogue traders. That is, they traded positions uh, that they believed were good ones to trade. They were involved in risky derivatives, not just the underlying, but things like options and straddles and collars and other exotic types of financial derivatives. There was little or no accountability. Again, as you recall in the case of uh, Nick Leeson, he actually controlled the accounting, the settlement, and trading functions. They also had, in most cases, total control of the paper trail um, in the Orange County Investment Pool, as well as with Barings Bank. Um, you know, there were hidden accounts, but the trader themselves were uh, controlling the paper trail when others came in to audit. Um, and then a lack of understanding and recognition by the executives of financial derivative trading and the risks of, uh, involved. Even today, a lot of executives uh, are not aware of the types of positions that their trading groups have put on um, or aware of what that exposes the company to from a financial perspective. Some of the more common risk measures that usually are implemented, mark to market. Mark to market is the value of a portfolio at the close of the day based on settlement prices. So let's say, for instance, you have some um, stock in an E-Trade account. You know, until you do something with that stock, until you sell it, you're not really making any money. But every day, the closing price on that stock can be marked against the price at which you purchase that stock, and you will have either an unrealized gain or unrealized loss on your portfolio. That is what's known as mark to market. Value at risk is a complicated theoretical maximum loss on a total financial trading book. Um, it's usually calculated for a given period of time, let's say a three to five day period. Um, a certain confidence level, this is st statistically speaking, you may want a 95 to maybe as much as a 98% confidence level. Um, a defined holding period and then expected market conditions. The expected market conditions are variations in price that could occur in the marketplace. It is expressed as a single value. For instance, um, a VAR on a book could be something like $10 million loss at 98% confidence level uh, with a holding period of, of three days. The prices within the system, uh, value at risk is calculated using uh, software systems that have huge algorithms. Uh, it will be based on historical energy commodity futures prices, as well as it will generate it its own through a Monte Carlo simulation module um, that will generate thousands of iterations of different types of, uh, of prices as it's a random number generator. So the mark-to-market calculation takes place, and then the rest of the algorithms calculate the VAR. A couple of more risk measures. Profit and loss. That's the daily profit or loss on the mark-to-market changes. So it's the daily change in the unrealized gain or loss after the portfolio is uh, marked to market. The volumetric position is the total of all derivative contracts in the book, including the options delta effect. I touched briefly on the idea of delta in the lecture on options. Delta represents the potential contract exposure that the writer of the option has. If the buyer of the option should choose to exercise those options, then the seller of the option is either going to have to go out and sell contracts or buy contracts to cover that position. And, you know, as time moves forward, their exposure to that changes daily. That's the delta effect. So when we're talking about the volumetric position of a financial trading book, we're talking about all contracts. The actual underlying uh, financial derivative contracts, as well as the implied number of contracts that the book is exposed to for uh, options sales. In April 1990, the introduction of the NYMEX natural gas futures contract added to the contract totals for crude oil they were already trading. It did provide price transparency, transparency and market liquidity. It allowed uh, commercial participants to hedge their price risk. It also provided a whole new host of financial derivative trading for speculative traders. So now you had a new proliferation of financial derivatives. You had options, puts, calls, various exotic options. 
we talked about the types of swaps. You have the Henry Hub lookalike, you have basis swaps, and you have swing swaps. So the number of financial derivatives exploded with the advent of the natural gas uh, contract on the New York Mercantile Exchange. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission um, mandated that publicly traded energy companies had implemented risk controls for fiscal year 2001. And one of the thoughts there was that they needed to calculate the mark to market on their book and report it as earnings. Obviously to the federal government that meant higher corporate taxes, but what they didn't realize was that if mark to market was going to be viewed as earnings, then companies could find ways to create and falsify their mark to market. This basically gave Enron a license to steal. They created various fictitious off balance sheet companies where mark to market earnings were generated. And the more earnings that they showed, then the higher the share price and so on. So traders would now have a large stake in the mark to market value of their book. So they themselves would begin to set the forward curves. That is, they would begin to go ahead and uh, set the future prices themselves. So this resulted in the manipulation of the mark to market. Um, they also set cash market indexes, which was you know, blatant market manipulation in the publications that we talked about in cash pricing. And they would roll their positions, their financial positions, forward and backwards to increase their mark to market value when it uh, was convenient for them to do so. In the post-Enron area, the top five natural gas marketing companies in the United States were gone within a year. Wall Street became very leery of energy trading companies, and you know, you'll know you see that um, after that point in time, a lot of companies became energy services companies and no longer energy trading companies. Um, Wall Street wants the book size um, analyzed and marked to market. They don't put much uh, value in uh, value at risk, if, if you'll excuse the pun there. Um, companies started to adopt FAS 133 hedge accounting, which shrunk the spec book because hedge accounting allows you to take a financial derivative that's truly a hedge and basically those two balance sheets are out in terms of your open positions. The remaining positions in your book are speculative. And then of course Sarbanes-Oxley uh, was adopted which created a, a massive amount of reporting for companies who are publicly traded and dealing in financial energy derivatives. So if you were to evaluate a company, um, these would be some of the recommendations I think that you should make. First and foremost, executive training. Executives have got to understand the nature of financial derivatives, the exposures, what's going on in their trading shop. So if need be, they can uh, pull the reins in on their traders. A risk policy and procedures needs to be developed within that. You should state the purpose of the hedging activity. It should list the risk measures and limits on each, each risk measure. There needs to be formal oversight in the form of a risk control desk. Uh, the positions and responsibilities of the risk control desk personnel need to be delineated. There needs to be some type of risk oversight committee comprised of executives, uh, generally the top executives in the company. There needs to be a trading policy with violation penalties for individual traders. Um, specific procedures need to be outlined as well. Um, it's highly recommended that they would adopt FAS 133 hedge accounting, which would shrink their speculative positions. Both internal and external auditors need to be educated. They need to understand financial energy derivative trading and its risks so they can make proper audits. And then, of course, um, the federal government mandates that Sarbanes-Oxley uh, requirements be adopted and uh, the corresponding reporting be um, timely produced.